Did you know Universal Orlando has some of the best kept secrets of any theme park? I'm talking screen use props from Jurassic Park. I'm talking about the real DeLorean from Back to the Future, and I'm talking a piece of the Berlin Wall. Yes, that Berlin Wall. We're on a mission today to find the best kept secrets at Universal Orlando. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's Molly with Mammoth Club and I'm at Universal today and we are going on a secret quest. How many times can I say secrets in this intro? We are going to find some of the best kept secrets, again, hidden details and Easter eggs that you probably don't know exist in the Universal parks. Everybody knows that Disney hides this kind of stuff all over, but not a lot of people realize Universal does too, so we are going to find screen use props, we are going to find little details that you haven't noticed before, and it's not all Harry Potter. Though, I couldn't resist just a little Harry Potter. But by the end of this, I bet even the biggest Universal fans, biggest movie buffs will learn something they didn't know. We got a lot to cover. Let's get to it. We are starting our adventure today in Universal Studios, Florida. Now this confuses some people because of the terminology. This park is called Universal Studios, Florida. That park over there that we're going to get to, that's Islands of Adventure. The entire thing, along with City Walk and the hotels, that's Universal Orlando Resort. So I know that gets confusing. A lot of people call this whole thing Universal Studios, but technically that's just this park. Universal Studios first opened in 1990. Now this was something that Universal wanted to do. They wanted to bring their successful tram tour from Hollywood over here to Florida. Uh, they wanted to get a little piece of that Mickey Mouse pie, if you know what I'm talking about. People were traveling to Central Florida to visit Disney World. Epcot already existed. Hollywood Studios, then MGM Studios beat Universal by one year. But that's when this park opened and it's been lovely ever since. Actually, that was a lie. It wasn't magical ever since. There were actually a lot of disasters when Universal Studios first opened, much like the opening day of Disneyland. The main attractions, Earthquake, the Big One, Confrontation, and Jaws the Ride all had huge technical issues to the point that they had to give people vouchers to return. Jaws closed just a few weeks later after being sued by the original production company. They had to completely redo it. The mechanics of it were not working, so they were off to a rocky start, but they figured it out pretty quick. Much like the Disney parks, the Universal parks have changed and adapted quite a bit over the years. Obviously, they added another theme park, they added a water park, hotels, and the only remaining ride left from opening day is the E.T. Adventure. There are a few remaining shows, but lots is gone, including my favorite, Jaws. But we're going to get into that in a second because we got to talk about something that's here at Despicable Me Minion Mayhem. Despicable Me Minion Mayhem is a show featuring, of course, the minions where you are shrunk down to their size as they try to recruit you to be a minion. It was previously in 3D, however, it notoriously made people very motion sick, so they took away the 3D portion of it. Um, and now it is like watching a fun minion movie while in an interactive seat. I actually kind of liked it better when it was 3D, even though it did make me sick because I thought it was more exciting. But now more people can enjoy it. However, one thing people don't often notice about Minion Mayhem are these plants right here. Do you know what a Minion's favorite food is? Uh, banana. Banana. If you said banana, you would be correct. So Universal planted these real life banana trees right outside the Minion Mayhem attraction. I don't see any bananas growing on them right now. They're probably not in season considering it's the fall in Florida. However, Minions, bananas, you get it right here. <laughs> An ongoing detail you can look for at Universal Orlando are the manhole covers. They theme them to wherever you are. So for example, we are in the New York section of Universal Studios Florida. And if you look at the manhole cover right here, it says NYC sewer. We'll check out some more manhole covers as we go, but this is a very fun detail that people just literally walk all over. V excited about Revenge of the Mummy reopening. This is one of my favorite attractions in all of Universal Orlando. In fact, it's definitely my favorite attraction in this park besides Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts. But this is a part dark ride, part roller coaster themed to the Brendan Fraser Mummy movies. And of course, there's some cool stuff to look for in the queue and on the ride. Gonna drop my backpack in a locker. If you're not familiar at several of Universal's attractions, you are required to put bags into lockers for safety. Their rides are a little bit more intense than Disney attractions, but don't worry, the standard size are free. The bigger size are $2, uh, and you will need to use your ticket to open it or your hotel room key, and then you can come get your stuff after you ride. Here we go. I love this attraction. Now, the plot of this attraction is that you are on the set of one of the Brendan Fraser mummy movies, which is why the queue is like half movie set, half actual mummy situation. And right here, our first thing to look for right off the bat, this gigantic door right here when you first walk into the queue, that was actually screen used in the film. Mm, no, Mitch, I know service. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, no mechanics service. It sounds crazy, I know, but a lot of really freaky stuff was happening during the shoot. It was grueling. As you walk through the movie set, you'll also see a documentary about them making the film. And Brendan Fraser talks about how everyone on set really did believe in the curse of the mummy. They all have the Magi symbol. He doesn't believe in the curse of the mummy. He thinks everyone's being ridiculous. And when you ride the attraction, you'll find out who's right. This queue is one of my favorites. It is spooky. It is scary. It is dark. It really puts you in the mood for this thrilling and creepy attraction. And there's a couple of interactive elements that you can uh, mess around with. The one, if you have two people, you need two hands to put on mirror. I wonder if someone will do it. Another interactive element in the queue, you can actually scare your fellow travelers. If you watch right here, if you watch right here, you can actually activate some effects to scare other guests. So you hit the beetle when you want to, but I'm gonna wait for someone to walk by to do it. It does take a while for the blue to reset, so time it accordingly. <laughs> Got him. And last, if you try and grab this hologram right here, see what happens. <laughs> that grabbing the hologram is particularly creepy because the mummy laughs at you and it's very scary. But this queue is so cool, this ride is so cool. One of my all-time favorites. Now, you can't film on the attraction, so I'm gonna go ahead and put my phone away. However, one thing you can look for is a nod to the original attraction that was in this building, which was Confrontation. When you go into a giant chamber with a bunch of mummies and golden statues surrounding you, look on the left-hand side and you will see a gold ape which is a nod to King Kong. That attraction is so fun. I'm so glad it's back. It does have a 48 inch high requirement, so not too high compared to other things here at Universal, um, but it is kind of spooky scary. So, I mean, it's dark, it's loud, there's mummies, or they literally murder a team member. So, you know, keep that in mind. Oh, so great. Um, Revenge of the Mummy does have single rider. It also takes express, so that's a great way to use it, but it often, the line doesn't get too long because they move people through there pretty quick. But make sure to check out those interactive things in the queue and look for that Kong when you ride. Headed to one of the final remaining opening day attractions here at Universal. But on the way there, I have to point out one of my favorite Harry Potter details. Even though, yes, we are very, very far away from Diagon Alley and from London. Now this is bonkers genius from the Universal creative team. If you look over in the direction of London and Diagon Alley, what can you see? You can see the top of King Cross Station, the train station, and you can see the dragon. But you can't see any other part of Diagon Alley. Why is that? Well, you shouldn't be able to see it because you're a muggle. Obviously, I'm a witch, so I can see it. No, but our muggle eyes aren't able to see Diagon Alley. It is concealed from muggles, as they explain in the story. So, when you are not beyond that wall, when you have not tapped into Diagon Alley, you can't see any of it. But why can you see King's Cross Station and the Dragon? Well, King's Cross Station is a real place. You could go there in London right now, so of course any muggle can see it. That's also why you can see things uh, like the record shop and different uh, buildings when you're over that way. However, the Dragon isn't supposed to be there. The Dragon, the wizards never intended for it to be on the roof of Gringotts Bank. Neither did the goblins. It, it didn't work out well for them. But because the dragon isn't supposed to be there, it didn't have a concealment charm on it, you can see it because she has escaped and sat on top of Gringotts Bank. But you can't see Gringotts Bank, you can't see any of the wizard shops, you can only see London, which you're supposed to, and the dragon, which maybe not. Now we head into the horror makeup show. Again, this is an opening day show, and it teaches you how they do some of the special effects and makeup from Hollywood. It's actually very, very interesting, and it's very funny. So if you haven't seen it, definitely recommend it as a nice place to sit down, get some air conditioning, and learn a little something about movie making. But you don't have to stay and see the show to see one of the coolest things that Universal's hiding. And that's this incredible movie props collection that dates all the way back to the 1920s. Universal essentially invented the movie monster with movies like Dracula, Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon. And you can see some pretty incredible things from some of the most iconic movies throughout history. Things like the knife and fake blood used in Psycho, monster face molds, Frankenstein's monster shoes, some of the Grinch's face, Chucky, Michael Myers, a raptor talon, and an egg, a clever girl, and my personal favorite, some of Bruce's teeth, and Ben Gardner. It's just wild to me that like this was used in my favorite movie of all time. 
this was also used in one of my favorite movies of all time. It's just like, if you're a film nerd, if you're a movie buff, if you're a, a like, it's just so cool. And a little bonus fun fact, a little Jaws bonus fun fact for you. Steven Spielberg said that after they added in the Ben Gardner scene, you know, where Hooper has the shark tooth that's about the size of a shot glass, and he's looking around, he's digging in Ben Gardner's boat, and the head pops out, everybody freaked out and screamed, and then for the rest of the movie, there's no bigger scream, even when the shark pops out for the first time, because once you scare your audience good once, they're on edge for the rest of the time. But this was the biggest scare in Jaws because nobody expected it. And the... Uh, Universal Horror Makeup Show is not the only place you can see screen use props in Universal Orlando. Come inside the Legacy Store. That is the real screen used Chief Brody jacket from Jaws. My favorite movie of all time. Just here at the Universal Studios Legacy Store. How much do you think it would cost if I wanted to buy it? Moving on to our next secret spot, but I did want to point out that the Media Center is open today. This is a very cool thing that Universal does where you can actually see a pilot of a TV show or a special or something they want to test out and get audience reactions to, and you can actually go watch and influence what comes on your TV. Now, I'm not going to do it today because we got a lot to get through on this list, plus it's not like I can film it and show you anyway, but you may want to do that while you're here at Universal if they're open. And we're not done with big movie props yet because as promised, here is the real DeLorean from Back to the Future as well as the Jules Verne train from Back to the Future 3. Again, these were screen use props. I wonder if I can get inside and go back in time. Going back in time would be pretty cool, but not if you get hit on by one of your parents. So now I'll be, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that not the almanac from Back to the Future 2? Right there in the driver's seat? That's funny. You can find the train and the DeLorean on your way to Springfield, which is also our next stop. And I just think it's so cool that this stuff is just like here at the theme park. Oft overlooked, but V awesome. We've made it to Springfield, home of the Simpsons. If you are a Simpsons fan, this is gonna be your paradise because there's lots of things brought to life from the stories, but there's one thing everybody should come check out. Now I know I've talked about the phone in the red British phone booth outside Diagon Alley in the London section, but did you know there's another magic phone here in Simpsons? Oh, and it's ringing. <laughs> It was an old cranky person that said they're not answering the police phone anymore because a crank calls unless there's a cat stuck in a tree. I don't know who it is because I don't know anything about The Simpsons, but if you do, share in the comments. I'm going to see if the phone rings again. Oh. Patty and Selma, they're going to sand down their corns and watch MacGyver. I don't know who that is. The point is, the phone rings, you answer it, and different characters from The Simpsons have something to say. Okay, that one was Bart. I know that one. And keeping up with our fun manhole cover game, you will see these say City of Springfield on them. I think it's time to enjoy another attraction. So we are going to head to Men in Black Alien Attack, where of course there's some cool things for me to talk about and point out to you in the queue, as well as something to look for on the ride. Men in Black Alien Attack is a shooter style attraction where you are headed into the Men in Black training facility and being recruited to join the Men in Black. And then things, well, they get a little hairy and you have to help save the universe. I don't care if you're not qualified. It, you're gonna have to help. However, when you first enter, you are going into a World's Fair, and there's actually elements of the New York's World's Fair from 6465 right outside the building. If you take a look at these flying saucer shaped towers, that is actually from the New York State Pavilion at the 64 World's Fair. Additionally, the facade of the main part of the building is designed to look like the St. Louis Arch because part of the film takes place in St. Louis. Now, even though this is a shooter style attraction, think Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin or Toy Story Mania over at Disney, it does have a short height requirement of 42 inches and it does spin, so you're gonna have to put your stuff in a locker. Welcome to the universe and you. We hope you enjoy this classic adventure into the unknown. Well, they interrupted the universe and you show to take us to MIB training, see if we have what it takes. Agent M. But there's a Agent M. Agent M. Is that is that me? But take a look at these doors while you're walking through. 
Or perhaps see what happens when you try and open fingerprint removal. Agent five, agent eight. <laughs> the doors are a little tricky, but jiggle the handles and see what happens. We've passed through a little weapons case, and now we are prepared to start training with the MIB. Again, can't film on the right, but something to look for. If you get on the right-hand track, there is an alien disguised as Steven Spielberg behind a newspaper. A couple of tips to help you crush on Men in Black. Number one, the most important tip, you don't have to squeeze the gun over and over again. You can just hold it down, save those fingies, save that strength. Number two, if you hit an alien, you will know because the alien's eyes will change color and your gun will react. Hit that alien again and again until you can't anymore. Each time you hit the same alien, it boosts your score even more. Number three, at one point you are going to face another car and they're going to say, you guys might be aliens, better hit them. And it's going to tell you to hit like a red thing above the other vehicle across the track from you. There's no rule that says you can't just turn around and point it at yours on your vehicle. Just know it's going to spin your car. But it's much easier to hit the one right behind you than it is to aim across the track. And last but not least, when you see that big alien at the very end, Will Smith is going to tell you to push that red button. Start pushing that red button as soon as you see the alien because the first person that does it in the car gets 100,000 bonus. Good luck. I did say we weren't doing a ton of Harry Potter stuff, but I have done a Harry Potter Secrets video that includes both Diagon Alley here in Universal Studios and Hogsmeade, which is an Islands of Adventure. And a lot of the Easter eggs I pointed out here in Diagon Alley are nods to Jaws, which was the attraction that was here from opening day until it closed to make way for Harry Potter. But one I did not point out is at this bathroom right here. This is one of the last room standing things from Jaws. This was the bathroom structure that was built for the Amity section of park and there is a little nod to Jaws that very few people notice partly because only half the population would go in here to begin with. Notice anything unusual on the woman on the bathroom sign here? Look closely and you may notice that she's lost a leg. I wonder what could have done that. Additionally, if you listen closely around here, you will notice the soundtrack does not match anything else in the area. It does not match the vibes of the Men in Black section we were just in, which is like 90s hip hop jams. And it certainly does not match the Harry Potter soundtrack that you can hear coming from Diagon Alley. Can you hear it? It's sweet 70s jams, and that's because Amity Island is supposed to be celebrating the year after the great shark attacks of 1975, so the whole area had sweet 70s music, and you can still hear it from this one speaker by this one bathroom. A few more non-Wizarding World nods to Jaws. If you look at that building right there, you'll notice that it's Amity Island Lobster Co. Again, this whole section used to be themed to Amity, which is the island where Jaws takes place. Amity, as you know, means friendship. And if you head down the side here, you will notice that there's a few other Amity businesses in the windows here, like the ship fitters and riggers. I only went on the Jaws ride one time. I traumatically retold the story during the Harry Potter Secrets video, if you want to know it. Um, long story short, I didn't actually see anything because I was too scared. But in that, I know the plot line of Amity Island was that you were celebrating the hero, Chief Brody, from the year prior. But why would Bruce be hanging here? He, he explodes. And the shark they hang up in in the town that the fishermen catch is a taiga shark. A what? So I don't understand why there's a great white shark hanging. I'm not mad about it because I like to say hi to them, but I don't understand it. If anyone knows the original plot from the, uh, the land when it was open, if you know the answer, please let me know. From one of the most beloved and long gone attractions to one of the most controversial and maybe the only person in the whole universe that loves Fast and the Furious Supercharged, we're headed in to show some cool Easter eggs for some long gone attractions here as well. Fast and the Furious Supercharged has a 40 inch height requirement and it's absolutely ridiculous. But to the people who hate it, I say it's a ride based on Fast and the Furious. What did you expect? I actually very ironically love this attraction because it's so ridiculous. And we're headed in through the single rider line because there are some cool Easter eggs to look for. Now, I don't typically recommend the single rider here because this attraction is best experienced with your friends and family so you can enjoy how ridiculous it is all together. But there's some pretty cool things to look for in 
Dom's trophy case. First up, speaking of old attractions, this used to be Earthquake, the big one. That was the original attraction here before it transitioned into Disaster. And you can see that this car right here has an Earthquake keychain on it. Next up, we've got another nod to Back to the Future. If you look at the uh, pinks right here, do people still say pinks? I know that from Greece. A race of pinks. Anyway, the owner certificate? We'll registration, about. registration, that's what it's called. Anyway, if you look at the registration right here, the owner is Emmett L. Brown and the keychain is a DeLorean. This is the certificate to the DeLorean. I guess Vin Diesel want it from him. If you know Smokey and the Bandit, you can see that this car was owned by Bo Bandit Darville and you've got the Bandit little car right there. Dom took that one as well. And it looks like Dom's been racing in the Wizarding World because if you look at this one right here, you will see it's an Anglia. A Ford Anglia actually previously owned by Arthur Weasley. That ride is just straight ridiculous. I mean, The Rock makes a gun measuring joke. Anyway, we are done here at Universal Studios Florida. You can take the train to get between parks, but it's also like a 10, 15 minute walk. And one of my favorite Easter eggs is on the way. This next one is so bonkers, you're like not even gonna believe me until I show you with my eyes through the camera and then to your eyes, this one. There's a piece of the Berlin Wall, like the literal Berlin Wall here at Universal Orlando and at the Hard Rock of all places. It's wild, come on. Universal Orlando has both a Hard Rock Cafe here at City Walk on that pathway between the two theme parks next to, next to Toothsome. There's also a Hard Rock Hotel, which is considered one of the premier resorts uh, very close, actually the closest hotel to the actual theme parks. And if you've been to a Hard Rock Cafe or a Hard Rock Hotel, then you know they are known for having props. They have costumes, they have um, uh, musicians, instruments, and things from famous artists throughout time. But did you know they literally have a piece of the Berlin Wall back here? If you're coming from Universal Studios Florida, you are going to take a right, right before the restaurant and the store, walk all the way back on that path, and when you can go no further, Look to your left and you will see a literal piece of the Berlin Wall. The plaque says, in August 1961, this infamous symbol of the Cold War was erected in order to keep the East Germans from fleeing to the West. The Soviets built a wall between the East and the West sections of Berlin. For the next 28 years, the Cold War raged on and Checkpart Charlie governed passage. The wall stood as a harsh reminder of the chasm between the non-communist West and the communist East. On November 9, 1989, the wall was symbolically brought down. Only a few parts of the wall remain. The Hard Rock Cafe is proud to display this piece of history that symbolizes the wall of oppression. Why is this here? Like, this is a huge thing from world history. This is a very serious piece of history. And it is at Universal Orlando at the Hard Rock. There you go. Is your mind blown yet? As we work our way over to Islands of Adventure, I do want to point out that the lighthouse, which is the symbol of the Islands of Adventure, the theme of this park is that each different land is a different island. That's why Marvel is Marvel Superhero Island, Toon is Toon Lagoon, you had the Lost Continent, you had Jurassic Park, which you probably know takes place on an island, but that's the theme. The lighthouse here was modeled after the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. Welcome to Marvel. Wow, Dr. Doom is loud. Welcome to Marvel Superhero Island, where there are a bunch of cool comic book Easter eggs to look for. First starters, above the shop right here, you'll see Nelson and Murdoch, attorneys at law. That is a nod to Foggy Nelson and Matt Murdoch from Daredevil. While many of you may have ridden Dr. Doom's Fear Fall, the attraction that shoots you up towards the sky and gives you a bird's eye view, of the theme parks, did you know that Dr. Doom used his fear fall machine to not only try and take your soul, but murder the Fantastic Four? And unfortunately, he did it. How do I know? You see, all their silhouettes are on the ground. Like, I believe that to be the human torch. This would be the invisible woman. I can't decide if I think this one is Mr. Fantastic or The Thing. I don't know the Fantastic Four that well, so help me out. I think this one's either Mr. Fantastic or The Thing, and then this one would be the other one. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I don't know much, if anything, about the Fantastic Four. I guess I have to learn now that they're joining the MCU, 
but I'm a late addition to the MCU fandom, but I did confirm with the team member that yes, those are the Fantastic Four, and yes, Doctor Doom threw them off the tower, so... Maybe you know better than I do. Let me know down in the comments which one was which. But they are there. And speaking of the comics, most of the comic book art throughout the land was drawn by an artist named Adam Kubert. And Adam Kubert made sure to sign his name in his artwork. So if you look at most of the characters throughout the land, you can find his name. For example, on the Goblin? Is that the Green Goblin? Yeah, I feel confident that that's the Green Goblin, but I'm sure you'll tell me if it's not him. But anyway, look on his hand, the left hand, the one without the pumpkin, and you'll see Adam in the scribbles. Here in Doc Ock, it's in his hand. You can see it right here, A-D-A-M. Look towards Spider-Man, and one, you'll notice that there's a Stark Enterprises sign right there. And two, the Atom is really hard to find on Spider-Man. It's the trickiest one, but if you look at Spider-Man's hand that's holding the web, look at his thumb down at the bottom, and it's in his Spidey suit. One more thing to look for around the amazing adventures of Spider-Man. It's time to pick up the phone again, because there's a phone right here, and I wonder what Boy. happens if I answer it. The crime line. Call the crime line, or if you pick up the crime line phone, it's for you to call in crime. So it's like, if there's an unnatural disaster, press one. If you've got a doomsday device, press two. So that's fun. Just basically, if you see a phone in Universal, pick it up. It's really fun to look for the atoms. I know that one's really hard to see, but it's kind of like finding hidden Mickeys, but it's finding hidden atoms. Also, nods on Spider-Man that you can look for if you ride The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man, which is a 3D simulator attraction, so I can't film on there anyway. But there is a Stanley cameo, actually a couple. Um, he's driving a truck. You also almost run into him on the street. And there's an Iron Man poster from Stark Industries as you're going through town. So a couple Easter eggs to look for on that attraction if you ride it. And we got to get out of Superhero Landing before I buy an Annie Ann's pretzel because, oh my gosh, they smell so good. But Donald Blake, MD, right here, that's Dr. Donald Blake from the Thor comics. We've made it to Toon Lagoon. Y'all know good and well I am not riding Popeye and Bluto's Bilge Ratch barges because you get absolutely soaked. But what I will do is head this way, past the attraction, where there is a cute little area to walk around that a lot of people miss with some great punny jokes. Back past the entrance of Popeye and Bluto's, you can actually see the olive. And you can tour the olive if you'd like. You can walk through it. It's a fun little experience. Or you can go on the lagoon viewing, which we are doing right now. The olive is a great thing for kids to do if they've got older ones in the party that are riding the attraction. Oh my gosh, look how wet these people are gonna get. Just miserable. I mean, they just got wrecked. Oh my gosh, you get so wet on these rides. Not for me. Not for me. Not only is this area incredibly peaceful, well, besides the screaming from Velocicoaster, but I mean, there's literally nobody else back here but me right now. But take a look down at the water and you might see some punny things. Like this, a school of fish. Get it? Or how about... Popeye and Olive Oil's mailboxes. Popeye and the other tunes here in Toon Landing might be a little outdated, but if you're looking for somewhere to get away from the crowds for a bit, that's a great spot back here. Now, on to Jurassic Park. First thing we're gonna do in Jurassic Park, eat an empanada. I need a snack. And so I grabbed this beef empanada from Natural Selections, which is a little kiosk right across from the River Adventure entrance. You can get churro bites there, you can get a papa relleno, and you can get an empanada. I've never had it, so let's try it. That's pretty tasty from a cart. It's got a hearty amount of beef in there. It's got some carrots and onions inside the beef mixture. It reminds me of the beef pasties that you can get in the Wizarding World, but those are small and more bite-sized, and this is a big one. It was $8 before tax and discount. Not too bad. I don't know that I'd rank it above more the iconic snacks at Universal. You know I love the green eggs and ham, the tater tots and Seuss Landing. I do like those beef pasties or fish and chips in the Wizarding World. There's lots of good sweet snacks in the Wizarding World too. But if you're in the mood for something savory and quick, not a bad choice. 
Now we are gonna pop into Jurassic Park River Adventure, not to ride though, but to look at the model of Jurassic Park. Some of you may know that this is a boat ride, which is why we're not riding it right now, because I don't want to get wet. However, you probably also know that in the movie, it is a Jeep ride. Well, actually, in the Michael Crichton, Crichton, Michael Crichton book, Jurassic Park, that the movie's based on, it was a boat ride. But Steven Spielberg learned his lesson from Jaws and knew that it's very difficult to make a film where water is a key component. So they decided to make Jurassic Park a land-based film. However, when Universal was working on this attraction, they knew they wanted it to be a boat ride. Not only is that a classic theme park style of attraction, but they knew that any attraction they made would be compared to the film. And it would be a lot easier to compare and disparage the attraction if they tried to make it in a Jeep, because they knew nothing they made would compare to the incredible giant practical sets and effects and technology and CGI and, and everything that Steven Spielberg used to create Jurassic Park the film. So they decided to convert back to the book origins and go with the water ride for the attraction. But there is a nod to the Jeep ride. It all comes together here in the model. If you look at the model of Jurassic Park, this is what Isla Nublar was supposed to look like. And you've got all of your main locations. You've got your visitor center, which is here in Universal. You've got Camp Jurassic, which is where Pterodon Flyers is. You've also got the helicopter tours. You've got the Triceratops paddock, the Jeep Safari over here. And if you come around the back side, here you have it, the river adventure. So it's all here. You just maybe can't access the Jeep tours when you're here. We're popping into the Jurassic Park Discovery Center now. This is modeled after the Welcome Center in the films, as you'll see here shortly. It's also the home of Burger Diggs, which is the burger restaurant of my choosing in a theme park. It's quite delicious. They've got sauteed onions and mushrooms for your burgers if you're into that. Uh, but as you can see, again, this is modeled after the Welcome Center in the film. So you've got your big dinosaur skeletons right here. And if you go downstairs, there's some interactive activities and secret details. This is another great place to come if you want to get a little bit of air conditioning. Again, there's some interactive activities. You can walk amongst some models of dinosaurs. There's some games. You can go to the nursery here and help a dinosaur hatch. This is great for people that don't want to ride or aren't tall enough to ride Jurassic Park River Adventure and Velocicoaster. But here in the nursery, we got to keep our eyes open for a few things. For starters, right beautifully in front of our faces there is Mr. DNA. Above Mr. DNA, you'll see they have a model of the Dilophosaurus that, you know, famously killed Nedry. My favorite's over here, though. Take a look upon this shelf, and this thing does move around a lot, but you will notice the infamous Barbasol can is hiding. And back up on the second story of the building, I'm in the Dino Store, which is the merchandise shop here. If you look up on one of the shelves, you'll notice the book Dinosaur Detectives, written by Dr. Alan Grant. That is the book that little Tim in the movie is carrying when he meets his hero and mine, Dr. Alan Grant. I talked about some other hidden books in the Velocicoaster queue when I did the, thank you, <laughs> how many rides can you do in one day challenge here at Universal? So you can check that video out, but there's a couple good Easter eggs over in the queue there too. I've pointed out this Jeep before saying that this one, as well as the multicolored one with the T-Rex down on the other side of the land, were both screen use, which is very cool. But now I want you to take a look on the passenger side seat and notice that yellow rain jacket. Any guess who it belongs to? Is this just so cool? Like, that Jeep was in the Jurassic Park movies. That's amazing. It's just so cool. All right, on to the Wizarding World, where I know I said I wasn't doing a lot of Harry Potter, but I've got a few new ones to point out. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love that Universal blasts the BGM, the soundtracks from that film. There is no more epic soundtrack to walk through a land to than Jurassic Park. It's that beautiful John Williams tickles my ears. And now I'm gonna head into Wizarding World where it's gonna keep going. Different John Williams, but you get it. It's just really much more fun this way. First up, we're headed into Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. This is that attraction that takes you inside Hogwarts Castle. It has so much Harry Potter goodness in it. I'm talking Acromantula, I'm talking Dementors, Chamber of Secrets, Forbidden Forest, Quidditch, Dragons, all kinds of fun. It does make me nauseous though, so. I'm gonna do what I advise a lot of you to do, which is if you're worried about getting nauseous, 
just walk through the queue and check out all the Easter eggs. This is another attraction that requires you to put your things in the locker. However, if you let the witches and wizards know out front that you're just walking through the queue, they will not make you do that. Mm, I get chills every time I walk in through this queue. I'm going through Express today. I upgraded my annual pass to be the one that includes Express after 4 p.m., um, which Express does cut off a good amount of the queue. However, the Easter eggs I want to show you, you can still see. And I did a really big, long, full queue tour in that. Uh, Harry Potter secrets video so check that out but when you go through Express you are going to still get to see some of the portraits it's a different image of the portraits that you can see in the regular queue so this uh, easter egg is around both times but you have the four Hogwarts founders you've got Salazar Slytherin, Rowena Ravenclaw, Helga Hufflepuff and Godric Gryffindor and you've heard me talk about them before because I talk about doing founder selfies Let's make it a happen. But have you ever noticed that each of the four founders is holding one of the Horcruxes? For example, Salazar Slytherin, he is wearing Salazar's locket, fitting. Rowena Ravenclaw, she's wearing her diadem. Helga Hufflepuff is holding her cup, and Godric Gryffindor is holding the sword, which, as you probably know, Voldemort doesn't successfully make a Horcrux, but he sure tries. Oh my gosh, they were talking about Hagrid's dragon being loose, and Salazar Slytherin's like, maybe with all these muggles, that's a good thing. Like, dang, are you suggesting the dragon eat the humans? Vicious. Okay, we continue on. We're in Dumbledore's office. But the next one I want to show you is in the Defense Against the Dark Arts room. I merged into the regular line. Again, I'm not going to ride the ride. I'm not taking anyone's spot. People can go around me because I'm going to walk slowly through the next room, which is the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom. Now, you've heard me point out the books on the desks, which are the books that Umbridge assigns to Harry Potter and his class in movie five. But what I've not talked about is that there's actually a nod to each of the Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers throughout the classroom. Up on the ceiling, you've got the skeleton of the dragon, which is brought by Professor Quirrell. Coincidentally, Gilderoy Lockhart's Pixies in year two take it down. You've also got autobiographies of Gilderoy Lockhart on one of the shelf. Professor Lupin has these spine candles, which you can see in Prisoner of Azkaban. Additionally, on the blackboard, they're teaching how to do Expecto Patronum, which Lupin famously teaches Harry. You've got Mad-Eye Moody's walking stick from Goblet of Fire. Again, on the desk, you've got the books that Professor Umbridge assigns in Order of the Phoenix. And last, we all know that Snape becomes the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher in Half-Blood Prince, and he famously uses this projector. Now, while the inconsistency does anger me, I appreciate this Easter egg, so I'll give it a pass. As I previously yelled a lot about how the Dementor lesson was on the board, but the book was wrong, I, I rescind that again. Last one I'll point out in Forbidden Journey, if you look at the stained glass window after going through the Defense of the, Against the Dark Arts classroom, this is an exact replica of a window in God. Of fire. There's just so many Harry Potter Easter eggs. Hopefully you're having fun learning them all because I'm having fun sharing them. Now we are going to head into Flight of the Hippogriff. This is kind of the barnstormer of this park. It's definitely a smaller family attraction, but there's a cute Easter egg to look for by Hagrid's Hut. Flight of the Hippogriff isn't something I recommend prioritizing and it will get a pretty lengthy line. But if you're a Harry Potter fan, it's fun to come walk the queue because you get a different look at Hagrid's cabin. You actually get a great view of Hogwarts on the attraction and there's a Buckbeak animatronic that you can't see unless you ride the ride. Most people keep on walking, but on the backside near Hagrid's hut, you will notice a few fun things. For starters, there's this trough and there's bags of Thestral feed and Hippogriff feed. Both of those creatures just eat a lot of meat, so I'm assuming there's just like dead rabbits in there. If you look up past the pumpkin, you'll see a crate that's been cracked open and it says Monster Book on there. If you remember, Hagrid assigns the class the Monster Book of Monsters when he becomes the professor of care of magical creatures in Prisoner of Azkaban. And it doesn't go well, but it looks like he was keeping his book in there. And then last but not least, my favorite of the Easter eggs back here. If you look at that jug right there, it says Wood Lice for Bow Truckles. Bow truckles are a little stick-like creature that they do not show in the Harry Potter films. They do appear in the Fantastic Beast films. However, they are a creature featured in one of Hagrid's classes. So I just love the little details and I love when there's book only nods. Walking through Hogsmeade, I can't resist pointing out just one shop window that I haven't talked about recently. It's dogweed and death cap right here. It's exotic plants and flowers. There's a couple things you may recognize in the windows. First starters, here's the Mimbleness Mimbletonia. 
which I cannot pronounce very well, but you know who can? Neville Longbottom, because he has one. But also in the window, this is an audio and a visual. You have got a mandrake right here. And if you listen up, you can hear it whining and making its little squeaky noises. We've made it to the Lost Continent, where I am headed down the backside of Mythos, which is a pretty good sit-down restaurant. It's Mediterranean food, very well-priced, very flavorful and delicious if you are looking for somewhere to sit um, and have a longer meal. You can kind of meander down this way. It is a smoking section, but we're headed to this bridge because this land is all about mythical creatures and legends and what kind of creature lives under a bridge. Now it can be kind of hard to hear, especially if people are going by on Hulk and screaming. But if you stand here on the bridge long enough, you can actually listen to the rumblings and grumblings of a troll. You know trolls, like the people who say Mammoth Club is a dub name because we didn't name our channel Molly's Magical Pixie Dust Disney Adventures. That kind of thing. There is one more land here in Islands of Adventure that I haven't pointed anything out in, and that is, of course, Seuss Landing. Now, I have pointed out a few Seuss Easter eggs before. In the potato challenge with Alan, I talked about how the trees are crooked because they were saved from Hurricane Andrew. In another video, I pointed out where you can see actual Dr. Seuss. But today, it feels fitting to do one more Easter egg about picking up the phone. Well, the Seuss version of a phone, anyway. If you pop through the Street of the Lifted Lorax, which is inspired by the tale of the Lorax, you'll see this weird building situation. And you see, I'm gonna call it a Seussophone, the Seuss version of a telephone, and it says, listen. Yeah, I don't know if that's the one I should have ended on because he recited the Lorax to me and I forgot how depressing the Lorax is. And he's like, unless someone like you cares an awful lot, it's not going to get better. It's just not. Help protect the trees. We're killing the planet. Humans are terrible. Well, that's a somewhat depressing end to our Secrets Adventure. I hope you had fun following along today. I had a blast. I love this kind of stuff. So if you want to see more of it, let me know. What was your favorite detail? What are you going to look for next time you're at Universal? Let us know that as well. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media. And until next time, friends, I am Molly, and it's been magical. Bye. Now go watch the Harry Potter secret.